Annie up anymore around. Thank you for being here. Uh, we have a nice little Boone Creek family here that loves history, and uh, we're glad that you have come. Uh, before we uh, get into the program, uh, I'm going to go ahead and chat. You want to come on over here? Just go ahead and put your stuff wherever you need to. This is Chad Bogart. He's our our number one. Are we considered an undertaker, or what are we calling him? He's the number one undertaker from the 1800s. Cleaned up. Look at that haircut. Don't that look good? <laughs> Slicked up with tie and everything. Took a shower. Yeah. All right. Yesterday. Yesterday. Before in the past, uh, he's given a couple programs for us, and we've given him one of the. Uh, Daniel Boone Knives, uh, Three Blades, and we've given him a uh, one of our books. This evening, he will go get in history of getting, uh, as, a, as a speaker, one of our toothpick knives. Now, a toothpick knife is not just a knife for just cutting apples. This is the real thing. So whenever you go around with your toothpick knife in your pocket, it will work for you. Yes, yeah, so... Just don't, we don't take you to the undertaker, so be real careful. Okay. Just, we'll introduce yourself, and uh, we'll let you take over the, the show. All right, thank you. Very nice. Thank you all so much. My name's Chad Bogart. I work over at Sycamore Shelf State Park in Elizabeth, and uh, had the pleasure of touring some of y'all uh, a couple weeks ago at Carter Mansion and the, and the park, so it's good to see you all again. And uh, the last time I spoke here, I think I spoke on James Robinson. And uh, it's kind of pointed because I just visited his grave last week in Nashville. So, uh, we're going to talk about uh, battlefield and bombing during the Civil War. And I'm always hesitant to uh, do this program at a, uh, at a what, an event where we have a meal. <laughs> it seems like every time I've done this program, there's been a meal involved. Um, but if anybody has any gruesome questions, I guess we'll say, we'll wait until <coughs> wait till the program's over and you can ask me because somebody might not be a stout stock in the group. Uh, but my grandmother was from Boone's Creek and uh, she was a good stout, uh, solid lady, so we'll hope that you all are the same. Uh, uh, so in that vein, we will start talking about embalming in the Civil War. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start passing around some, uh, some photographs. These are from the time period, uh, and they kind of show some uh, aspects of embalming during the war. So we'll start these over here. Let's pass these around the room while we talk. Um, embalming <coughs> is really something we don't like to talk about, is it? Even today, um, I mean, it's part of part of everyday life. I mean, we all have people dying every day, being sent to the funeral home and being involved, but it's kind of taboo. We don't have to talk about it, even in a historical context sometimes. Uh, but it is part of everyday life, and so, uh, like I said, in that vein, we'll start uh, talking about embalming. The word embalm means simply to put on a bomb. Uh, the act of applying spices or something perfumed to uh, minimize the smell of, of a decaying body. Um, going to have a little quiz throughout the program. Um, who, raise your hand if you can answer this question. Who were the first people in history to really be heavily involved in embalming? The Egyptians, that's right. You get your pick. Paul was a railroad man. Mary Patton, powder maker of the revolution. Or the Ulster Scots. Which one do you want? The second. Mary Patton? Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, the ancient Egyptians. Uh, you really can't talk about embalming unless you mention the Egyptians. Uh, they embalmed to preserve the body for religious purposes. Uh, they believed that the soul would re-enter the body a thousand years after death, and so to preserve the body as best they could meant for a pleasurable afterlife, so that the person could have a body in the afterlife. They would even uh, mummify horses and their pets and their uh, <coughs> servants to go along with them to the afterlife. So it was a great 
very much a part of the religion. Um, and of course, as we said, that produces mummies. We I mean, all know what mummies look like. There's even a mummy uh, in our state museum in Nashville. Uh, I told that to somebody one time. He said, there's also some other mummies in Nashville. I said, of course, that's the city state uh, but uh, if early Christians really did know uh, uh, means of preserving uh, bodies uh, after death, but there were some instances uh, during the Middle Ages of uh, knights who fell during the Crusades uh, that were somewhat preserved and sent home. Um, up until the time of uh, chemical embalming, Really, the only way to uh, transport a body uh, was to put it on ice, and that was kind of logistically tough to do that. Uh, so chemical embalming made it very easy and uh, helpful to transport a body if need be. Uh, this first came about um, in the early 1800s uh, by a Frenchman named Jean Gennard. He was uh, an apothecary's assistant in France, and in his later life, he uh, uh, started doing chemical embalming as a profession. And he was the very first person to uh, offer embalming to the public in France. Uh, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about these folks living in the Victorian age um, and their concept of death. Uh, to die in the Victorian times was very much a part of everyday life. Uh, it was considered, they had this thought of having a good death, what was called a good death. To have a good death meant that you, uh, you died at home, uh, surrounded by your loved ones, perhaps a minister was there to offer words of faith or encouragement as you passed on, and uh, a Christian burial would follow that. Uh, people were so extremely close to death during that time period. The body never left home until it was buried. Uh, the, the family cleaned the body, prepared it. Uh, usually if it was the man, he probably made his own casket. Uh, the family put the body in the casket. They had the wake and the funeral right there in the house. And uh, then the body was buried. So it was very personal, very extremely close, the family was to death. Uh, and even the funeral, uh, today, uh, a funeral really is just as much for those who are left behind that it is for the person that you're honoring. Uh, we, we have their favorite songs played, we tell stories about them, and that helps us as grieving family members or friends to cope with their loss, and it's the same way that. But the Civil War came along and destroyed all of it. Uh, if you were a soldier, you died on the battlefield in the Civil War, you were not close to home. Family was not there to hold your hand as you passed on to the other side. Uh, no minister usually was there to offer you words of encouragement. Usually on the cold ground or in a dirty hospital. You were scared and you were sometimes buried in an unmarked grave or a mass grave. That is completely the opposite of what people wanted during that time period. Um, also, uh, the enormous amount of casualties during the Civil War uh, brought on a great number of bombers. Over 750,000, uh, three quarters of the men were killed during the Civil War. So the desire to transport bodies home uh, to be buried by loved ones really presented a need for these bombers, and they turned out in droves. So, who were these embalmers? Who, who, were, who became the, the battlefield embalmers during the war? Mostly it was medical doctors, uh, surgeons, or commissioned military uh, uh, medical staff. Uh, they already had a, a good knowledge of human anatomy, so it was kind of logical that they would be the ones chosen to embalm. But also, as the war progressed, a large number of civilians, civilian doctors and surgeons, gave up their medical practice to become embalmers. For one reason. Can anybody tell me what that might be? Money. But here you go. Money for money. Yeah. Uh, battlefield embalmers were mostly a northern uh, occurrence, uh, simply because.
because the chemicals that were used in the process were manufactured in northern factories and it was hard to get them into the southern states because of the union blockades of the southern ports. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there weren't Confederate uh, soldiers buried up in bomb. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about one of those Confederate officers that was involved. Uh, I got interested in, in researching uh, Civil War and bombing when in 2014 uh, our SCV camp in, in Greenville, the John Hunt Morgan camp, uh, presented the 150th anniversary of the death of General Morgan at the Dixon Williams Mansion in Greenville. And uh, Tim Massey, my friend, is here tonight. He's our camp commander. And uh, so we got our heads together and said, hey, we need to uh, present the embalming of the general because they embalmed him right there in the Dixon Williams Mansion after he was killed. So we did a little research and we did it. And uh, Tim portrayed General Morgan. And uh, so you can see he's holding up pretty good. <laughs> Yep, yep. So, y'all need the services, you know that they work with. But I would say probably 150 people came through the house that day uh, just so that they could get a glimpse of that unusual part of a reenactment that they've probably never seen before. And it was, it was unusual because it was 150 years to the day. Uh, we reenacted the embalming in the same room and possibly on the same piece of furniture that the original general was laid out on. So that was quite, quite unique for, for us to do that. And I enjoyed that very much. I don't know how much Tim enjoyed it. He had to lay real still. Uh, <laughs> that's a story of That is a story of itself. That's right. That's right. So we, we did make history 150 years to the day. Um, most of these embalmers were honest men. But as with any profession, there's always some scoundrels out there. Uh, unscrupulous people. Uh, Washington, D.C., of course, was the center of the federal military at the time, and so most of these embalmers set up shop, as you might say, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then at one time, there were over 900 embalmers set up shop in Washington. They became such a nuisance that the government had to run out of town. Um, early on in the war, uh, they would say somebody would embal be embalmed and a family wouldn't claim them. Well, the embalmer would just set them up in the front of his shop as a display. <laughs> kind of as a, as a sign, you know, say, like, hey, look, this is what we can do for you for money. Uh, yeah. And uh, so that got to be kind of unpleasant for the townsfolk there, and uh, so the uh, military had to run out of town. Um, so when they left the city, uh, they began to, to do what was referred to as following the war. They would just travel right along with the armies. Uh, after a battle, they'd set up shop and uh, take care of the dead right on the battlefield. Uh, you can't talk about Civil War era and bombers without mentioning Dr. Thomas Holmes. He, was, uh, he is known as the father of modern embalming. Uh, formaldehyde, what we know is formaldehyde is a preservative, did not uh, come about until 1866, the year following the end of the war. Uh, so most embalmers experimented with various chemicals like uh, creosote, mercury, turpentine, various forms of alcohol. Uh, it was not until the late 1850s that Dr. Holmes uh, stumbled across a uh, uh, a mixture which was then believed to be a safe, non-toxic form of embalming fluid. It, however, uh, contained four ounces of arsenic per gallon. So uh, that was the main chemical for preservation in embalming fluid at that time. Uh, but he did perfect what we know today as a modern technique of embalming. And he began to sell his concoction for three dollars a gallon uh, to other embalmers. Uh, he gained uh, fame in 1861 when he uh, embalmed uh, a very, uh, well, not a very slightly uh, <coughs> well known person. The, raise your hand if you know this answer. Who was the first Union officer killed in the Civil War? <laughs> Colonel Elmer Ellsworth. Oh, yes. Ellsworth uh, took 
a small contingent of men to take down a Confederate flag on top of the hotel, and the hotel owner killed, John Hill. Uh, Ellsworth uh, had served with Abraham Lincoln in uh, his uh, law office in Springfield, Illinois, so Lincoln knew him personally. And so he planned a special funeral service for Colonel Ellsworth in the White House. And he called uh, upon uh, Dr. Holmes to uh, embalm Colonel Ellsworth. Uh, during the funeral service, Mrs. Lincoln uh, remarked that uh, Colonel Ellsworth looked natural as though he was sleeping. And the very next year, the Lincolns would call upon the embalmers again uh, when their son passed away. What was his name? Tom. 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 to operate his uh, embalming office there in Washington, D.C., uh, but also practiced on that as well. He is credited with embalming over 4,000 soldiers. Uh, all right, well, we've talked about who these embalmers were, so let's talk about who gets embalmed. How in the world, at the start of this war, do all these embalmers wind up paying customers? How do they do it? Well, at first, the embalmers would go directly to the soldiers and uh, talk to them before they went into the battle. And if the soldiers signed on, uh, they got a card that stated that they had arranged for payment to be embalmed and shipped home to their families. Uh, so this uh, soon became pretty bad for morale, as you might imagine. Uh, so the army put a stop to it. And uh, so the uh, soldiers were then, they would go personally to an embalmer and make the arrangements. And, uh, and then it would be done out of the view for the rest of the men. Uh, to embalm a, an enlisted man during the time, $25 at the beginning of the war and $50 for an officer. By the end of the war, it was $30 for an enlisted man and $80 for an officer. So as you might imagine, the embalmers were more interested in embalming the officers uh, because they could get more money for it. The officers, you would pay well to do families, and their families could probably afford it. Uh, they would have soldiers go out and bring them the bodies of dead officers. Uh, they would uh, take care of their bodies and then work out payment at a later date with the grieving family. Um, so, now we'll get down to the nitty gritty. How is it done? Uh, if you've had a chance to look at some of the tools up here, uh, you can see that they're, uh, that they're pretty ungiving. Uh, but the Klein deal doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't argue much with you. Uh, so uh, most of the time, the uh, bombers would come in after the battle, and they would pay soldiers, a small amount, to go out and bring the bodies in that had either previously signed up or officers that were said before. And sometimes there's instances that there would be over a hundred bodies uh, waiting to be involved. Uh, as the pictures are being passed around, you've seen just the two barrels and the door laying there, and that was his workstation. Sometimes they would set up a, a tent. Most of the time they would set up in an old building, a barn, someplace like that, as you've seen in the pictures. Um, the main thing that you want to do is stop the decay. That's, that's exactly what you want to do. Um, First off, you need to drain the body blood. Um, but sometimes, uh, when the bodies come in from the field, they've already bled out on the battlefield because they're riddled with blood holes and what have you. So that's, uh, that's a plus. You don't have to worry about that if, it, if, that's, if that's the case. Uh, then you have to replace that blood with embalming fluid. And there's three different techniques that were used during the time. The picture that was passed around close up there uh, you should saw a piston style pump, and that was probably the most popular to take out on the battlefield because it's metal, it doesn't break, it's easy, and uh, so that was the piston style. The style of embalming uh, device that we have here is a squeeze bulb. You fill the, uh, uh, fill the glass vessel with embalming fluid. Usually takes about two gallons per person for a normal sized adult male, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more. You uh, uh, insert the cannula into a blood vessel, 
they leave the neck or under the arm or in the groin. And then you make another incision from, on another blood vessel uh, so that as you squeeze the bulb, you're pumping air into the uh, vessel. The air pressure pushes the embalming fluid through the cannula and into the veins, and then as the, as the uh, embalming fluid goes through the veins, it pushes out what blood remains in the body. Same as that. And so you just stand here and squeeze it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for about two hours, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, and then the third type is a gravity flow style. They would pick up a device similar to this, but the vessel would be hung up high so that the fluid could just simply run down by gravity. And you wouldn't have to worry about the strenuous activity of squeezing the in yourself. Like I said, it takes about two gallons, about two hours worth of work to do that. After the body is uh, embalmed, uh, they're simply put in a wooden box. Their personal belongings are put in the box with them. Uh, their name, their parents' name, their hometown stamped on the bed, and they're shipped home by rail. Uh, so that's pretty much um, how it would happen. Uh, I do want to read to you a section uh, out of a magazine article that came out uh, a few years back, and this gives a uh, first-hand account of, uh, of an embalmer. Joshua S. Smith, a corporal of Company G, 5th Regiment, Wisconsin Volunteers, died in the hospital in Washington, D.C. The evening before his death, Captain Bew visited him and found him, as he supposed, very much improved, so much so that he expected to be able to join his company in two or three days. The next morning, Captain Bew learned his great surprise that his comrade was dead. Captain Bew had the body embalmed and expressed home. In a letter from Captain Hughes, he described the manner in which the embalming was done. The body was rendered new and placed in a horizontal position on a platform. A very small incision was then made in the left arm to get at a vein. A tube was then inserted in the vein and attached to a pump. The pump was set in a vessel containing about two gallons of a prepared fluid, and then this fluid was injected into the blood vessel. Before the commencement of the operation, the face was very much emaciated and the body quite reduced. But in a few seconds after the commencement of the embalming process, the blood vessels began to enlarge, the face became full, and the whole body assumed a lifelike, healthy appearance. All right, raise your hand if you can tell me. Now, this might be a trick question. Don't get, don't get tricked up here. Who was the first American president to be embalmed? Abraham Lincoln. Which one do you want? Ulster Scotts or Paul of the Railroad Man? Uh, Paul of the Railroad Man. That's a good one. Good job. Right. Um, yes, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, first American president to be assassinated and first American president to be involved. It was uh, at Mrs. Lincoln's request that uh, the president be involved after seeing what a good job the embalmers did in Colonel Ellsworth their son Willie. It was doctors Charles Brown and Harry Cattell that performed the procedure. Uh, they shaved Lincoln's face, leaving that recognizable tuft of hair on his chin. They set his mouth in a slight smile and dressed him in his best suit. And this is from that uh, same article. Dr. Brown's advertisement touted that the bodies of the embalmed uh, would be kept in the most perfect and natural state of preservation a claim that would be put to the test on the Lincoln funeral train. To keep the body in the condition that the embalmers had promised, Dr. Cattell traveled with the funeral party, providing the president's body with touch-ups along the way. After the war, Dr. Brown quit embalming and took up dentistry in New York. <laughs> Dr. Cattell also quit and became a lithographer and then a policeman on the Washington D.C. police force. He never told his family that he embalmed President Lincoln. And remember Dr. Holmes, father of modern embalming. Dr. Holmes resigned his commission and began charging $100 per embalming to the public. Following the war, he returned home to Brooklyn, New York, and did very little embalming after that. Oddly enough, before his death in 1900, he requested that he not be in 
<laughs> so that's just a little bit about the very little known subject that field bomb in the Civil War. Does anybody have a, I think we've got time for a few questions. Not as long as they're not too gross. <laughs> How long has the body laid up for it to be in the uh, Well, I'd say it would have to get pretty, pretty quick to it. That's probably why they followed the, you know, followed the board. I really don't know. I mean, you know, as hot as some of the days were. You know. I have been told that uh, Union uh, federal troops decayed a whole lot quicker than Confederate troops because they were so well fed, right? They were so well fed, they had a lot of fat on, on their bodies. Yeah. And uh, Confederate soldiers were just wiry and sinewy, almost walking them as themselves already. So. What, what, was there uh, uh, an equal amount of involvement that went on with the Confederate troops? Uh, very much less. Very much less. I suspect so. Yeah. I, I wonder that the uh, you know general had two sons killed in uh, Ohio, in Kentucky, and they're both buried next to each other. I wonder they probably were involved. Probably. I mean, the, the Jacksons could afford it. Um, when uh, John Hunt Morgan was buried for the first time in uh, Hollywood Cemetery in uh, Virginia, uh, I guess it was, what year was it? 68? 1868, um, uh, Basil Duke had him exhumed and moved back to Lexington, uh, Kentucky, where he was from. And uh, he didn't get to see uh, the general when he had died, so he ordered them to open the casket. And uh, they did. And so this was four years after his death. And he reported that uh, the only thing that had changed was a small brown spot on his forehead. So four years, you know. So that arsenic has done his job. He would have thought, how long would it take the body to really be composed? Well, Lincoln's body, um, I don't know when they finally interred him for the last time. I don't know. It was when Rutherford Hayes was running for president, I think. So that was 1887. Um, and they tried to steal Lincoln's body. I'm sure you all have seen the program on TV about that. Um, and so Robert Lincoln, his son, had him buried under several feet of concrete. Um, but they... The, the folks on funeral detail asked, got permission to open the casket because they wanted to view the body of Lincoln. And they said that they opened him up and said that he was in, he looked just, just like he ought to look. And said there was a peculiar pattern of uh, threads and dust on his chest, red, white, and blue. And what it was was a tiny American flag that had been placed on his chest that had disintegrated just to, to dust, really. And that's what that was. But he was in good shape with the flag. Yes, ma'am. Did the embalmers do anything about, like, their hair or facial or put any kind of incense on their body after they got all the embalmers? Yeah, down? they, they had a, a product, a chemical called uh, uh, thymol, and it's oil of thyme, the, the herb, and that kind of helps cut down on odors and things like that. Uh, sulfur was used, camphor, things like that, you know. But by the time you've arrested the decomposition, you know, it's pretty, pretty good to go there. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned uh, about the stealing of Lincoln's body. The, the group might be interested to know what happened about Elvis's body. I was a close friend with the attorney for the cemetery where Elvis's body was first placed. And there was so much emotion and interest, they had to disinter the body and move it to Graceland. And when that happened, it was in the middle of the night, and the FBI and all the state law enforcement agencies were involved, and my friend was in a helicopter in the middle of the night watching this process. <laughs> Do you know why Alan Elvis' body was preserved? 
Probably on the day of the run. Two grandsons with me, so I'm modeling a little bit. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm up here and I'll justice for you. And as you see, I am wearing one of the lovely golf shirts. <laughs> and Miss Hyder has the price of the golf shirts, too. Yes, I do. Come on, let's this see. This is our big fun. Oh, okay, just a minute. Come right over okay. here. I can spring a little bit. <laughs> can you hear me? This is our new fundraiser. We're going uh, to have some clothing or some hawks that we're selling. These are both of my grandsons. I talked them into it, and I think I'm going to have to pay them for me. <laughs> uh, James uh, has a uh, short sleeve t shirt on. Sleeve it off, I can see a little bit of it. With our logo. These are 100% cotton. All of these. Garments are just great as far as washing, filling the washing machine, and they look great. And I turn all my clothes inside out, and they suggest you do that to these. Turn them inside out before you wash them. They're just filling in warm or cool water, and you can uh, dry them in the dryer just very, very low. But they're easy to take care of. Now, the other thing he has on is our hoodie that is this one zips. It has a uh, turn around hoodie at the back. I've got prices sticking up back because it's driving me crazy. This is the hood. The, the, these are very, very heavy, wonderful garments. Uh, it won't be one that you wash one time and take the other dry and say, ooh, what happened to this? Now, Patrick has the same thing. He has a short sleeve t shirt on. We also have long sleeve. He prefer the long sleeve. This jacket that he has is virtually an all weather jacket. Now, all these come either in white or blue with our logo on. And these logos, they, they've done a beautiful job with the logos. So this is kind of a, it's uh, rain. I mean, you wear this in the rain, but it is lined. And it's lining that keeps you, you know, really warm. So, uh, and Tappy wants this to wear a lot. She said this is good because it's got pockets in this also. Do you have a hat? Oh, it's right here. Oh, okay. We also have ball hats. 
that they can wear. He didn't all fit it on, so I'll try to get them to put it on. So, so they come in white and they blue also. They're a polyester, they're a lightweight, but they're, they're a good quality. Uh, it's an Adidas hat. You want to slip it, not just for a minute, sure. What's the price of the hat? Uh, price of the hat is, wait a minute, I'll take that off. $18. Dog shirt is waiting. I have to look at it. We haven't had them that long, but I don't have them all down. They are thirty-seven fifty. Uh, this is the most expensive piece that we have, and it runs sixty, sixty dollars because of the, you know, the uh, difference of the line and what they do. Everything's watching. The long sleeve zip for the hoodie is um, this one zips up is forty-five. They have one that you pull over your head. You, no, you don't. We don't have the one. It's back there. I can show you if you're interested in that. It's thirty dollars. But these run sixty. Those run forty-five. Uh, Lily's polo shirt, or I call it golf shirt, is thirty-seven fifty. The t-shirts, the short sleeve, run twelve dollars. The long sleeve ones run twenty dollars. We also have them for children. So if you've got any grandchildren or children, you know, I'll sell you those also. But uh, this is our new fundraiser, and I hope everybody will buy at least a half. Well, it's not half. <laughs> you always wear half. Yeah, <laughs> at least a half, because I think, and these are good parts, so I think you would enjoy them. And also, uh, it's good advertising for us, too, <coughs> for the trust. Any questions? You're going to do this by ordering. If you want one, you just order, right? I'm sorry. You're not going to have them out to take. No, you order. No, I have to take orders. Yeah. And it doesn't take that long to get them. Uh, they do them here in town, so it's, it doesn't take that long. But I will take orders. I'll take everybody's order tonight if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Lily, anything else you want me to cover? No, no. The fact that you're taking orders and it's uh, top quality material. Yeah, these are these are really really nice. Uh, so. Nice looking young men too. Yeah. Oh, I know. And I <laughs> Thank you very 